This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm David McDonald. I'm Sam Mercier's. And this week, Nate is away. He is at a music festival in Branson, Missouri, and Patrick is out with the bad, a bad case of the conflicts of interest. And so we are joined this morning by fellow Sound Notion host, uh, host of Streamers and Punches on our network, the Film Music Show, and also professor at Florida Atlantic University, our good friend Kevin Wilt. Kevin, thanks for joining us this morning. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, guys. And this morning, and go ahead, Sam. I was just going to point out that it looks like Kevin might be trying to become a contender for the strongest beard in new music. He's working on it. So beard, a red beard, I think, has it more innate power than a regular beard. It does have a little so, Thor quality that it, that it brings with it, I think. Yeah. Yeah. That's very, very nice. strong work, Kevin. Yeah. Good, thank good you. Good work. Thank you. Um, so have you guys been reading about this this week? It seems like there's been one story that has dominated my uh, my music-related news intake in the last week, and that is the New York Metropolitan Opera. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, David, the New York Metropolitan Opera, they are not an organization who is known for their portrayals of the works of contemporary composers, particularly living composers. And I would say, but listener, this is how I address you in my head, they are currently going to be performing one of the, the, the few operas of one of the few composers whose names normal people might actually know. One of our Pulitzer Prize winning composers. In as much as we have a flagship opera company in the United States, it is the New York Metropolitan Opera. And in as much as we have a um, vaunted celebrated flagship composer in the United States, it might be John Adams. And they are going to be performing his Death of Klinghoffer, which is a work that is only about 25 years old, premiered in the early 90s. And uh, they announced this week that they would not be doing their usual uh, web simulcast and radio broadcast, TV broadcast, and theaters live in HD streams for this particular production due to concerns over anti-Semitism, which is a little bit crazy because... From my perspective, the only people historically that have even accused it of being anti-Semitic or, or have gotten any any uh, any ground on that issue are his daughters, Leon Klinghoffer's daughters. This is just like Nixon in China and Dr. Atomic, uh, two other John Adams operas based on a true story. Um, the title character, Leon Klinghoffer, his, his two daughters and the Jewish Anti-Defamation League are pretty much the only two groups that I've seen coming out really strongly against it over the last couple of decades. Um, and for some reason, they have convinced, they've been able to successfully convince the Met to not stream this performance. Now, there's a number of things that I think are pretty weird about this, and I wrote uh, a long kind of rant on on medium about it and we'll have the link to that in the show notes right sam you're gonna link to me absolutely all right I'm, I'm using your blog post as my main uh, source material for understanding the piece uh, understanding the conflict well i think you should really expand that to be the main source <laughs> of understanding the world um i think i think that's a, a healthy thing um, but if you're not familiar with this opera, it, it, it follows the story, uh, to the true story in 1985 of the uh, hijacking of a passenger liner uh, that was traveling, I believe it was traveling in the Mediterranean. It, it was, had a number of Palestinians, a number of Jewish people on the boat. It was hijacked by members of uh, Palestinian Liberation Front. They took over the the ship and at one point shot and killed uh, an elderly Jewish American guy uh, who was in a wheelchair and dumped his body overboard and it was this horrible tragedy it was it was all over the news um, and John Adams decided to write an opera about this in uh, 1991 I, th I want to say um, so this has been around for a while. It's been performed a lot. I actually saw a production of it in St. Louis. They did a new um, production of it, St. Louis uh, Opera Theater St. Louis, in in collaboration with a couple of other opera theaters around the country. I want to say San Francisco was the other big one. 
um, of kind of a lighter version of it, a stripped down, smaller instrument version for smaller performance spaces. It was very, very cool, very well performed and very well received. Um, and uh, there, there are a lot of concerns over uh, anti-Semitism because there are Muslim terrorist characters in it and you actually get to meet them and confront them. And I, my argument in, in my blog post is that part of the reason we have the arts and part of the reason the arts are good is that we want to um, confront things that are uncomfortable. And, and, and a lot of times good art is good because it makes us uncomfortable. And I think it's kind of a cop out to, to back away from that. Um, and, and it's not a vice. It's not a bad thing to in, to look at evil people as people and try to understand what makes them the way they are. And that's really uncomfortable because it makes them more like us. And we don't like to think of ourselves as capable of doing horrible, evil things. And I've been talking way too long. Do you guys have any thoughts on this? Um, well, I'm, I was just, uh, I'll confess, I was reading uh, the plot synopsis on Wikipedia, which is the one thing I didn't get to this morning. Uh, uh, you know, I am in pretty much in agreement the thing that uh, seems strange, it seems like a lot of people are having a knee-jerk reaction. Um, I was reading about the, the premiere, and it does say that the da his daughters were outraged. And some people say that it seems sympathetic towards uh, the hijackers, and some people say that it's the opposite. However, at first blush, for people who don't know that much about it, which I bet that a lot of people who are throwing their social media muscle into this don't know that much about it, it seems to me that the, the thing you take away is not anti-Semitism, that you, that you fear it might be, would be anti-Islam or anti-Muslim, because it's portraying a sh an airplane that was hijacked. It's a ship, by, it's a boat. Oh, okay, a, a boat that was hijacked by, you know, that group I, I don't understand um yeah it's it's very very strange in that regard and and another thing that um is i think pretty weird about the whole thing is the way it's been portrayed in some media outlets that there is like a there's a debate it's it that that you know reasonable people can agree to disagree as one of my favorite podcasters likes to say, I agree to nothing. I do not agree to disagree. The, the, there are not two equal sides to this argument, and pretending like there are is what drives the the discussion forward and doesn't let us move on anymore. Because we should address well, these people because they're wrong, right? There's not it's not it's, there's not two sides about climate change. Climate change is real. There's not two sides about the Holocaust. The Holocaust was a real thing. Like there's, there are not two sides about every argument, and what drives me particularly crazy is that one outlet in particular, New Music Box, which is published by New Music USA, a new music advocacy organization in the United States, put out a blog post, and Molly Sheridan, Molly Sheridan, who we love and have had on the show, and and we have a lot of respect for her and Frank and all the other uh, people at New Music Box, saying, "What do you guys think about this? I don't know." That's you would expect moronic. them to take a stand, and this they they is, do not take a stand at all. This is an organization that should be advocating for the arts. Mm -hmm. This is, right. they should be saying this is crazy. This is one of the most important works of the last thirty years, and people should see it, even if it makes them uncomfortable. People need to see this important artwork. This right. is what we exist to do: is to get. And by we, I mean New Music USA. This is what New Music USA exists to do, is to get art into people's ears, right? And it's not like, it's not like taking a, an, an actual historical event and painting it with characters in some sort of dramatic setting and retelling that is, I mean, that is part and parcel for opera. That's what it's done its entire history, right? You know, taking stories that people know and turning them into an onstage drama. And this is exactly the same. Um, the thing that I thought was interesting, this is the Anti-Defamation League um, tweets, a wise choice, met offer to cancel Klinghoffer HD airing in November. So easy to misunderstand and exploit this work in our uneasy world. So they're saying that like this 
can be used for X, Y, and Z. Therefore, we sh they shouldn't do it, which that is an anti-art statement right there. Yeah. Right. That's ridiculous. Right. And I think, and Dave, you're kind of alluding to this. That's. It seems like the the, the argument that is being had is is not the right one. It's not a question, or it shouldn't be a question of, is this opera offensive? Yes or no. It's, isn't this isn't isn't art meant to make us ask these kinds of questions? And the answer to that is yes. That kind of seems like it. At least good art. Yeah. yeah, I mean, ab absolutely, and and that's that's kind of one of the things that I think is is so frustrating about this, and, and even about that tweet that Sam mentioned, that there's so it's so easy to misunderstand this thing. Well, maybe we should see it and talk about it, and then develop some understanding of it, right? And then we won't have the misunderstanding, right? The, the opera exists to help maybe bridge that misunderstanding gap, right? Right. Right. What, what were you gonna say? I, I read a tweet. It was like a week or two ago by Stephen Fry, the British uh, author and comedian actor. And he mentioned, I forget what it was, he mentioned something about the idea of um, being offended, that, that so often people respond to things by saying, oh, you know, I, I found that offensive, or that that offended me. And, and his argument was, was basically, so what? You know, I, I have no control, whether it's a, you know, a film or a, a story or whatever, I have no control on how you are going to respond to something. So if that's the way you've responded, what does that have to do with, with me, the person who created the thing? Um, well, you, that's a slippery slope. I, I mean, yeah, but, but I think his, his, point, his point was that for someone to be offended by something is, really has to do with their own reaction to it. And, and as the creator of something... You can't really, especially like Sam saying, a good piece of art. I mean, if you're writing something that's just you know cheesy or crappy or whatever, it's different. But as the creator of something, you can't necessarily predict or determine what everyone's reaction is going to be. Um, I guess his point, and, and it is a slippery slope, is sort of that because of that, you can't really be responsible for people's reactions. I don't know. I don't think that I don't think you can be entirely <coughs> unresponsible for people's reactions yeah. because you yeah. do control what goes into it and you can You can you anticipate. Know, yeah. And you can like go out of your way and actually make something that is offensive and maybe that's the point of the work of art. Right? Yeah. Even if that is the point of the work of art, that's okay. Right? Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, if if you want to put a crucifix in a jar of urine and call it a sculpture, that's still a sculpture, and we shouldn't. And and you can be upset by it, but that doesn't mean nobody should ever see it, right? right. That's, and it's not like that piece is only for people who will be offended by it. Yes. It creates, you know, a thought process and a conversation in everybody's mind who looks at it. If I look at it and it doesn't offend me at all, but I certainly think, well, I think that's going to piss some people off, you know, and that's the beginning. That's, uh, to me, to look at that and think that is a good thing with a piece of art. Like if I wrote a piece and only, the only thing anybody had to say was, oh, that was so lovely. That was so lovely. And that's what right. I got from everybody. I'd be like, oh, God, I really missed it that time, you know. Um to me, the, the 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 position of saying we shouldn't air it, which should be pointed out that they're still staging it, which is and crazy, it's been staged, and it's been staged <laughs> hundreds of times in New York. Well, not hundreds, maybe, but a, a bunch of times in New York City, which is the highest concentration of Jewish people in the United States, probably. I'm not sure. I don't but know. Probably. Kevin lives in Boca Raton. Um, I do. I do live in South Florida in Boca Raton. So <laughs> okay, I'm probably well in between. Second. Between Boca, New York, and St. Louis, which I, I would be willing to bet that the opera's been staged in all of those places. Um, I would you know, be surprised if this opera has been in South Florida. I really we don't. haven't noticed. We haven't noticed <laughs> uh, the fact that it can be used as this anti-Semitic tool, as the Anti-Defamation League puts it. But to go further than that, if they're going to say we can't do things, uh, we can't uh, be a party to something that can be turned to a vile purpose, then the Anti-Defamation League is anti-theistic religion, obviously, right? Because that's the thing on this planet that's turned to the most evil of anything that exists. So that the they must be an atheist organization, 
All right. Well, wait a minute. They're I, probably. Yeah, not. I don't think that, I don't think that's true. Actually. Yeah. I think yeah. I think but I think he, you're going to get a letter. <laughs> yeah. You're going to be but, hearing you know, from their if, lawyers. If their standard is we can't be a party to things that might be turned to some vile purpose, there are lots of things besides this that fit the bill in 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 a way more direct and way more vile way or in, in a way that is yeah. vile. This is not. Well, and, right? and as we pointed out, this has been around since '91. They should have anticipated where yeah. they are and the, the the world that they live in in New York City and the kind of opera that they're putting on, and maybe done a little bit of outreach leading up to this performance. Yeah, right. That, I think and this that's... is essentially what St. Louis did. St. Louis did a lot of outreach programs leading up to this performance of the Death of Klinghoffer, and everybody thought it was really great. And there were a lot of conversations about um, the Israeli and Palestinian conflict and they brought in refugees that lived in St. Louis and had these conversations in in front of people and mm -hmm. that l was part of this whole summer community thing that that Opera Theater St. Louis presented and now having said that even if the Met did that in New York the nature of a broadcast is that it goes everywhere Right. Um, and they they can't reasonably stage those kinds of things in in every radio market in the United States, but they didn't do any of it, and 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 the Met being not particularly known for their community engagement, um, I think dropped the ball again on this one. What were you going to say, Kevin? I that I, this is kind of. What it seems like the most annoying thing about this story is that you have, like you said, you have an opera that's 25 years old with an organization like the Met, the, the amount of lead time and the preparation that goes into something like this, I'm assuming extends back a couple of years. So for anyone to pretend that this kind of snuck up and, oh, gosh, we didn't realize this was, you know, it's, I don't know, it, it, that just seems ridiculous. And can we just point out again that they're still staging the thing? Right. Like, they're still putting it on in New York? If you really think it's offensive, then maybe you shouldn't stage it at all. Now, right. I think it's dumb yeah. to not stage it because it's offensive, and I think it's an incorrect interpretation to even consider it offensive. But aside from all of that, if you're saying that we don't want to broadcast it because people are going to be offended, why would you put it on? Right. Like it's okay yeah. to, it's okay to offend people in New York, but it's not okay to offend people in Chicago and in in other places. Maybe, in the maybe people who maybe people who watch opera in a movie theater are just more susceptible to being offended than people who actually go to the theater. I don't know. The, and, and, the and, cultural and, literacy of, of New Yorkers makes it such that they can take it. That's what it is. Oh, that that must be it. Yes. Right. They they have thicker skin. Right. I think. But yeah. Uh, it's very, very frustrating. Not, it, 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 everything about it is frustrating. The, interpret the original interpretation that leads to this dispute is frustrating. The reaction to the dispute, yeah. the lack of foresight from the Met, the, the decision from the Met, the way people are talking about it on social media, it's just absolutely mind-blowing. And, and, and there are some cynical people that are, are, are writing that, well, this is going to definitely cause them to sell out every night of their performance at, at the Met, but what mm -hmm. about all the places that sold tickets to go see it in theaters around the country? Right. Yeah. Like, well, I, you was, know, I was I'm, planning to go see it. Um, take, as an example, like, the 24-hour news industry relies a lot on Kool-Aid drinkers, and I would say that the biggest outlet that relies on that is Fox News. However, there are plenty of liberal Kool-Aid drinkers, you know, I don't think it's the, the, the point where they get their information from is as focused as Fox News. But here's an example of what I'm talking about. People who just latched on to the idea that it's a good thing they canceled the simulcast and it's a victory for equality and blah, blah, blah. Abraham Foxman, who is the national director of the Anti-Defamation League, admits he's never seen it. But he's behind not showing it. As if it, it talks about Palestinians and Jews in some context, that's enough, it seems like, mm -hmm. to say, well, we can't show that. Well, and it, more, importantly, more importantly, it treats these Palestinian terrorists right. as, though as terrorists, it treats them as people. It takes right. these comic book supervillain type characters and says, you know what? 
they have a mom and a dad and they had a childhood and they grew up and something about their childhood that was different from your childhood turned them into this and you into that. And that right. makes people really uncomfortable. And I It'll, can, it I allows can totally them to be understand. more than Yeah, it allows them to be more than Arnold Schwarzenegger villains, and that's a problem. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and that's like they're they're real people. They're not these two-dimensional you know comic book things. They're they're I I don't understand why why it's not why it's not okay to think about their humanity as well. Um but Clearly, clearly, I disagree with a lot of people uh, on yeah. a lot of things. And and well, the last thing, why do we think that you can have characters in a story that hold a belief that is different than the belief that is held by the story as a whole or that is held by the people that make it or present the story? I have a friend, a very good friend, who doesn't like Blazing Saddles. One of the funniest movies, for my money, the funniest movie that's ever been made. Yeah. Because he says it's racist. It's the opposite of racist. <laughs> yeah. There are racist characters in it who are right. made fun of mercilessly. Right. The purpose, the purpose of Blazing Saddles is to make racism look as stupid as it actually is. Right. Right. And it does a brilliant job of it. The movie's hilarious. And to me... And that's the whole thing that the knee jerk. If if it addresses a controversial topic, then it must be bad, right? And right. that that leads to boring bad art. Yep. Um, I think we may have that, killed this horse dead, but put a button on it. Well, one one last thing is that that people use the, the structure of the music, how they have paired choruses of the Jews and the Palestinians. Oh, and the Palestinians and, get to go first. Yeah, and and people take that as. <laughs> What was the, the, there's a, the way it puts it? Moral equivalence. Another uh, the the New York Times piece says that people are upset because it seems to demonstrate moral equivalence. I don't think it does that. I think it tries to demonstrate human equivalence. Like you said, these are people who got to this place somehow, mm-hmm. and demonizing them is not going to get you anywhere. Understanding them and the other side, both sides, might get you somewhere. Yeah, very very frustrating. Mm. Um, but we got a lot of we got an opera heavy A block this morning. Uh, so there's another opera story from the United States that has <laughs> really grabbed our attention this week. Um, have you Some guys heard of the it. Have you guys heard of the Hartford Wagner Festival? No, well, yes, yeah, this, this week yeah. I have heard of it. Um, <laughs> so the Hartford Wagner Festival exists which was a surprise to me uh i don't think they've ever presented anything i think they're brand spanking no new. they're they're brand spanking new but their goal is to present the ring every year in hartford which is wonderful right everybody sure. should have the opportunity of seeing the ring live i think that that's great i would love i've only seen videos uh in in movie theaters and in, in, in at home i've never somebody seen can have my live. seat say what somebody can have my ticket Really? That's that's very not a, unfortunate. Not a, not, a, not a Wagner fan. Well, I'll take your ticket. Um, they want to stage the ring cycle, though, without an orchestra, because orchestras <clears throat> are expensive. Mm-hmm. So what they're going to do is have a digital performance of the orchestra, right? Um, now, this is... Sam, you are feigning... Some you you seem to be mocking this concern. I think this is a huge concern. I am not necessarily concerned as much about. So there there are two concerns here. One is the uh, the the welfare of musicians who are not going to be paid for all of these rehearsals and performances, and that's that's certainly understandable. But that's not really even my main concern. My main concern is this is stupid. If you can't afford an orchestra, then you can't afford to do Wagner. End right. of story. If you can't afford an orchestra, then you should find something else to do. You should perform smaller operas if you can't afford an orchestra. Maybe instead oh. of doing four five-hour operas, you can do one three-hour opera and that will cost you as much now you won't be able to sell as many tickets to that so maybe you should figure out something else to do maybe you should do smaller operas maybe you should do chamber operas Mm -hmm. maybe 
holy cow, maybe you should commission somebody to write you a new opera that uses a, a, a medium that is of a size that you can afford with your budget. Give me a By call. putting a CD in. Give me a call. You could write, you could commission an opera. You could commission that an electronic has, opera. There you go. you go. That, to me, is the solution if you really have money problems. I, I agree with you, Dave. It's bad that musicians don't get the work, but that's like saying if it's it's like saying it's not they are or aren't going to get the work. I mean, this is going to happen and they're not going to get the work, but it's not like something could change and they would get the work if that's what they're determined to do. Right. I don't I don't see a problem with doing it. I mean, I'm really? not I think it's going to be awful. Kind of, I can't I, I can't here's, think of Here's the thing. If people buy tickets for it and show up, then it's awesome. And that's all that matters. I mean, they're trying to make money. They're trying to put on a production. If people show up, and don't tell me that a lot of like, you know, these people who just like drink in every phrase that comes out of singers' mouths. They love to hear Bel Canto style singing, and they'll do anything to hear it. I bet you they'll fill the house if they do it. But I, I see. I would argue that that Wagner is the one opera composer you can you can really say that that's kind of not what it's about. I mean. There aren't many opera composers who are using the orchestra in such a way that makes it so integral to the story as Wagner. I would, I would think that Wagner would be the last opera composer yeah, where you would try really, to use a canned orchestra. You can't really do a piano reduction there. No, you can't. I mean, yeah. I think if, if you're doing something smaller or older, you know, you do Monteverdi with a, with a canned orchestra or a piano or whatever. But Wagner, the color and, and the nuance of the orchestra is so crucial it, that just just seems like a really poor choice. Not that it's a great idea for any opera, but for Wagner, it just seems like a really bad idea. No, I I disagree. I I don't, I, I, I don't see. To me, that opinion d- depends a little bit on a you know, and a little that that kind of lifting but, but, up. But Wagner you're talking event. about but you're talking about the audience that you would expect to show up for something like this are going to be those people that are obsessed over every turn of phrase and everything anyway. Right. I mean, those are the people that are going to go see Wagner, and that's exactly the kind of thing that's going to matter to them that they're not going to get with a canned orchestra. Well, here's the other thing. Uh, the On the receiver side of that, do you think the tickets will be cheaper? Like, that'd be an interesting question. I'm sure they'll are, be cheaper. Because they're hiring, yeah, you would they're hiring young up-and-coming singers. They're not hiring yeah. Bryn Terfel and they're Stephanie young Blythe to come, to come do the, their ring cycle. Yeah, And using a canned orchestra, so... It would be – I'm not saying – this is aside from whether or not I think it's okay to can Wagner, but uh, you know, if they sell them like less than half the price you'd pay to go and watch it with a real orchestra or even less than half, I think they'll fill up the seat. Mm-hmm. The, and I don't have any kind of aesthetic the, problem. And the, well, so – and it all stems from – and it, these these are really all symptoms of the kind of like uh, bourgeois – Opera is fancy, and right. Wagner is fancy, and therefore we need Wagner and other things that we could present are not fancy because they're not the <laughs> ring cycle. And it it strikes me as putting on an opera to be fancy. Yeah. And yeah. I, Without spending the now, money to be fancy. Right. It's now, a couple, aside... couple of... Go ahead, Sam. Sorry. Go ahead, Kevin. The I was Toyota say, Avalon of opera production. <laughs> right. There, there, there are a couple of things that that I find curious about this. The, the first is, if you're doing this with a canned orchestra, and maybe this is in w- one of the articles we've linked to, I don't know, um, are the singers going to have to, are they going to have a click? I mean, if you're using a canned orchestra, you don't have the flexibility. I think that's problematic. That's a problem. Yeah. The other thing, it's and this like- is, and I'm sure this person is getting paid nicely but holy crap i cannot imagine trying to do a nice sounding digital mock-up of 12 hours of wagner i would kill myself that is a monumental task also can i just say uh technical difficulties hilarious (laughs) that needs to go on youtube i will watch that on youtube (laughs) so we, I think, I think this one um, will be interesting to watch. They have uh, postponed their their 
uh, their performances, I assume based on the reaction they got to their initial announcement. Um, Let me be clear about something, however, before we move on. Well, I don't have a problem with using a candle register, and I'm not offended. My Wagnerian self is not offended in any way. I don't think you have a Wagnerian but, self. <laughs> I do think that it was a dumb decision for this for their premier thing yeah. to, to to not realize that some of the the people for whom Wagner is their religion are not gonna like demand burning them at the stake, and that's what happened. So it was, I, think, uh, I can't yeah. believe they didn't realize that would happen. I think Dave Dave has a good point, which is these are not those people. Yeah, the, these the, are dilettantes. That Wagner is fancy, and the ring cycle is the fanciest of the fancy. So let's do the fancy thing. I mean, and and we'll all put on our our tuxedos and have yeah, a fancy we'll all put night on tuxes out. and pearls, and it'll be great. Yeah, yeah. I, I, think I think that's a lot of this. That's what we're seeing here, and they just they just didn't they honestly. I think they honestly didn't understand that it would be a problem. I think they really had no idea. Um, speaking of people that have no clue <laughs> in the opera world, and no, this is not steering back to Peter Gelb and the New York Metropolitan Opera. Uh, Kevin found us this story uh, from <laughs> from Opera Australia of a, uh, of a soprano who... Is she's from Georgia, the oh, nation I, of Georgia? I, yeah. I thought you were going to do the other story first. Sorry, I didn't mean to be laughing about a homophobic story. No, what other story? The crowd the thing. story. Oh no, sorry, I <laughs> I skipped. Um, okay. Well, sorry, I I broke it. Um, the That's Opera it. Australia. There's this this lady uh, singing soprano in Opera Australia production of Otello, and she was reacting to some news out of her home nation of georgia and uh kevin what did the tweet say oh you know i don't remember word for word let me see if i can bring it up here she they there's a a gay pride parade in georgia and she uh and it got i believe it got shut down and so she was commenting that uh, that um something along the lines of she was thankful that um the, the referring to the parade, the, this piece of propaganda, uh, which was trying to bring the fecal masses to the people of Georgia. So, yeah, she, she was basically referring to uh, the lesbian gay community of Georgia as the fecal masses. And there are a lot of people that are pretty upset about that little comment that she made. Um, so there has been a so lot apparently of pressure. There are gay people in the opera community. Some yes. Did you, are, were you aware that they were often involved in theater? I, I don't know if you if you knew that or not. No just, way. Um, I'm never going to the theater again. Yeah. She so, further so, she further illuminates. <laughs> no matter how unhappy friendly West might become, fortunately the Georgian people are well aware of what treats offered by the West in their menu to eat and what to discard. Just like my small dog guesses it. So this is a pretty vile, like yeah. very very vile. Set of beliefs she's holding here. She is. She has doubled down on <laughs> yeah. bigotry. She has yeah. doubled down on bigotry, and I, 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 I think she. We may be past the point of no return. I mean, yes. I, I think they're going to have to get rid of this lady. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing is, this happened a couple of days ago, and they have yet to fire her, uh, despite a lot of pressure on Opera Australia to do just that, and they kind of haven't done it yet. So. We're gonna give her the sound notion bump. <laughs> so, except it's instead of like unlike the Colbert bump, it's the you're gonna get fired now bump. Right, yeah. it's the iron fist. <laughs> that's it. But that's it's it's in a, it, the question that I've seen raised on social media a little bit, uh, especially this morning as we were kind of prepping for the show. If you know, let's say they fire her today, it's it's kind of already too late. It's really one of those things where if Opera Australia was gonna save face then they probably should have done it immediately. And they kind of have nothing to gain now by by doing it. Well, and apparently some of her other appearances have been canceled since then. Okay. O well, Opera they do Australia have something to gain. They, they, have, they have getting a bigoted asshole off of their cast, so that's what they have to gain. Right. And, and you know, right. this kind of, at this scale of opera, there's an understudy. 
right? There is somebody that can do it. And also, by the way, it's Verdi Zotello. Like, there, there are people that have this one under their belt. It's not like it's a world premiere of something nobody's ever heard before. Like, they can call up 84 people and have them on a plane the next day. They can, they can sing the, the snot out of Verdi. Right. This is. It's not, not like it's the death of Klinghoffer, where there's going to be a bunch of surprises that no one has ever run into before. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. this is this. Unlike Klinghoffer, which has only been around for 25 years, this has been around for like 150 years. So, right. you know. Anyway, uh, now we can go to the story that Sam thought we were talking about earlier. Yes. Speaking of people doing stupid things at at, at public performances, uh, Sam, I know you've you've crowd surfed before, but have you ever done it? In a performance of of Handel's music, who hasn't? I mean, come on. Oh, you mean Handel? I thought you meant Handel, the uh, you know the German punk band, Slovakia, <laughs> yeah, the German punk band. No, but in all honesty, I have because my friend uh, Aaron and I both had the opportunity to get into a bona fide "you might get your glasses broken and get a black eye" mosh pit at a headbanger show. I have done that. But I have never tried crowd surfing at uh, Handel's Messiah. Well, which oddly is performed not at Christmas, apparently. Uh, well, I, it's only it's, part of Handel's Messiah is about Christmas. It doesn't. That's, I know that. I was just going to say that. Christmas. Like, it's really about well, I, the whole thing. Like it's the whole the beginning I, part and the ending part are are both there. Uh, <laughs> I've never seen it performed. Not I've never experienced it offered not during the Yule Tide. Let's say. Yeah. Oh, really? Well, yeah. you're missing out, uh, or not. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, the, the, this is one of the greatest headlines uh, of all time ever. So uh, thank you to uh, Metro.co.uk. Uh, we have, um, let's see, leading scientist ejected from classical concert for attempting to crowd <laughs> surf. <laughs> That would be a great show title for today if it wasn't so long. Oh, my goodness. Ah. Leading scientist is what makes it art. <laughs> um, yeah. So this was not just a regular dude. This was uh, Dr. David Glowacki uh, got, quote, very overexcited, according to the theater's artistic director, uh, during <laughs> the Hallelujah Chorus. He is I, knew, a, I knew it was during the Hallelujah Chorus. He is a it. chemist. Um, and I, I guess they were already standing because that's a thing. That, that was my argument. And I said that before we started the show is people already stand up during the Hallelujah Chorus. Going from standing to crowd surfing doesn't seem like it's that huge of a leap. If everyone was you know sitting politely and some dude just decided to crowd surf above them. It's a bit, bit of a bigger jump, but yeah. Well, do you guys do you guys think this is something that the, the the classical world should be embracing, or do you think that this is not appropriate? I think this. I don't think. I think the spirit is what they should be embracing, and actually, that was the reaction I saw a lot to this story. Was you know, musician friends and things saying, "I want people like this at my performances. I want an audience that is enthusiastic and is engaged and isn't just sitting there quietly." Maybe crowd surfing is not. The, the best way of going about that, but the fact that this guy was engaged in the performance and, and enthusiastic, that's not something that as composers and performers that we necessarily want to shy away from. Absolutely. It, the, the thing I wonder is, you know, I mean, I'm not going to be sitting in a concert hall listening to Messiah and get the idea to crowd surf unless there are other mitigating circumstances, you know, it, that's that's what I'm saying. Be, you like, wouldn't want to do it if everyone was just sitting there quietly. That would be awkward. You have to assume there was that the crowd was whipped into some <laughs> sort of something to make this guy think that that was gonna. Because it's not like you can just crowd surf without I mean You ha, it has to look like your efforts are going to be supported. It would seem before you actually <laughs> commit at all. In, 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 or I don't understand crowd surfing. Right. Or, There's a difference you know, between crowd like, surfing and trust falls. Right, was it or was it like a Judd Apatow film where like he jumped up on stage and then dove and then splatted when everybody moved out of his way? I mean, who knows? Um, in in the, the age of uh, smartphones, is it too much to ask that somebody could have filmed it? Yeah, really? let your buddy get out his phone before you do anything like this. If you're, if you're considering doing this, right? Tell the person next yeah. to you, hey, get your phone out. 
You're gonna want to see this. Video you, and and make sure you, you take you, the video in 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 landscape mode because you don't want to be those dummies on on YouTube that have their stuff <laughs> going the wrong direction. Yeah. Uh, and and then do it and then send us the video, uh, because we will definitely 000, play it on Sound Notion. You so. want to get four hundred thousand hits in one day? That would that would have been your ticket right there. Yep. Yep. Uh, I think I think it would have mash that up I, with. The organist, like botching the end of the Handel's Messiah, that video that's been around for several years. Uh, oh, yeah. You... Yep. Oh, yeah. Sounds good. Sounds great, actually. Um, in in completely unrelated news, YouTube uh, is playing hardball with some record labels. They are apparently starting a new music service, a sp specifically a music video service. And they're not revealing much about it, but it does involve making new deals with all the record labels that currently post their music videos on YouTube and music from their artists on YouTube. Um, if you're not aware, YouTube is one of the main places that, that uh, especially very young people, go to listen to music. Um, the, the most subscribed to channels on YouTube, about half of them are music channels. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's a, it's a really important place for discovery and for virality because it's very easy to link to YouTube and embed YouTube, uh, in ways that it's and not easy to do for, for some other places where you can listen to new music. Um, so it's music a, professors use it too, because I a lot it. of classical music, uh, I use it constantly because a lot of classical music fans post stuff and it's. They they intelligently post it so that if you need the second movement of this piano sonata by this guy, it's a mm. lot easier to find it at times on YouTube than it is on Spotify. Like you know, you're I mean, we bitching about how Spotify and other music services handle classic music, of course, is a recurring theme on the show. But because YouTube, it it's dependent upon the passion of the person posting it, you know, and if they are intelligent enough to give you, you know put the metadata enough of the metadata in the title it's easy to find certain things so what's going on here <laughs> is not. what's going on here uh is that youtube is threatening to uh r block videos from labels that have not signed deals with them labels uh, videos that are currently on youtube right now they're going to block mm -hmm. those videos for labels that have not signed this new deal for this new service with them um, and a lot of people are up in arms about that because these are services that have put their stuff on YouTube like normal. Um, what YouTube is saying is uh, that essentially if you don't make a new agreement with us, then we don't actually have a license to play these mm -hmm. videos. We don't have a license to, 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 to stream these videos to people without you agreeing to this new uh, terms of service. Um, now, we should say that they, they have already done deals with all three of the major record labels, and they have also done deals with a, uh, the vast majority of uh, independent labels as well. Estimate, uh, uh, estimates are around 90% of the music industry has already signed on to this new system. And in fact, uh, The Verge was reporting a leaked memo that they got a hold of uh, from one of these, these uh, record labels, Believe Digital, uh, saying, quote, the new contract includes a significant increase of revenue share rate on user-generated content for sound recording. This type of use is currently the largest source of revenues from YouTube. So that user-generated content is people, um, like Sam is saying, taking a recording, doing something with it to make it a video, and posting it on YouTube. These are people that are making lip sync videos and um, people that are make, kind of making their own... Uh, uh, Harlem Shake dance videos. Har yeah, Harlem Shake is a great example, right? And um, dance videos and things like that do very, very well on YouTube. And those, those kinds of participatory viral phenomena like the Harlem Shake. I mean, the Harlem Shake was a number one the Billboard Hot 100 uh, tune last year based on the fact that all those people were including it in their videos because those those views get counted toward the, the Billboard charts. Um, so this is something that can be of benefit to record labels, but for, for whatever reason, and we don't know what because the agreement is not public, uh, the terms are not public, uh, there are a handful of labels that are staunchly against this, some that represent some pretty important artists like Adele um, that are not interested in doing these deals. 
So um, it would be interesting to see what happens. Um, it seems like they uh, are, are skirting a very fine line here with their uh, their Digital Millennium Copyright Act free harbor or safe harbor provision where they don't exercise any editorial uh, control over the stuff on there. Like one of the reasons they can say, well, it's not our fault if people upload stuff <coughs> that they don't own the copyright to is because they don't choose editorially what goes up. And this could be seen as, as violating that. Uh, however, I think the way they are expressing it is, is is that we don't have a license to this stuff, so we can't do it. Um, I don't know. Do you guys have any thoughts? I don't know. I mean, it's hard to say that what you really think until you actually see it in practice. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but it sounds like it has the potential to be bad for small artists in a big way. And... Uh, and impinge upon sort of the, the democratic nature of YouTube, you know? Yeah, I agree. That's one of the things I really love about it. Like, what does the Fox say? You know, I don't know what the if there's any, like, music industry affiliation that guy had, but it looks, like, pretty homemade but really cool, you know? And that went crazy. Went to number and six on the Hot 100. Is that going to – will this negate the ability of just, you know – some schmuck off the street who has a great idea and makes this thing that takes off is he not gonna, he or she not going to be able to do that anymore so i think they this is some kind of an agreement so i think this is specifically for the new for the youtube partner program for people that that are entering into a business agreement for a revenue share on the ads this isn't going to prevent anybody from just that. uploading their own stuff i understand that but then they say that they're going to block music stuff that's already there um why would they take that step? Like, why don't well, they? Well, because, and so what I'm saying is, they legally, if they don't have a license to stream those those recordings anymore, then uh, then they then they have to take them down. Okay, but I just don't understand what what the I mean because the democratic nature of YouTube makes it such that if if a piece of content on there performs, it performs. It doesn't matter if it's Adele or if it's Sam Mercier's or anybody else. Right. Right. Um, and so I don't understand why they would want to come to an agreement with a smaller label that doesn't pay as much because aren't you still going to get paid based on what happens with the product itself? You know, doesn't that build in cost controls for people because it's popular or it's not popular? Does that make sense? I'm not sure I follow. Well, if they're they're negotiating with certain record labels and the artists on those labels are going to make more money. Why more than independent labels? No, no, no. This is a new agreement for everybody. It's not just for majors and independents separately. This is a, this new agreement is applies to everybody. It's a higher percentage, uh, revenue share from the advertising revenue. Right. Okay. Well then I don't understand what the controversy is then, I guess. Well, the controversy is that they're they're removing these videos from YouTube that w that that they had presumably said would would be available for everybody, and this is you know them kind of uh, threatening based on their market position where they are kind of the place for streaming video on the web. There's not like you can't go across the street to another video service and expect the same audience as you get at YouTube, um, and. Uh, and and so there are. I think there's a reasonable argument to be made that this is anti-competitive because they're right. they're they're uh, exercising monopoly power over these over these record labels. I mean, I it's a tough position because as as if, as people who listen to the show a lot may know, uh, Sam and I are pretty big Google shills. Uh, so it's 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 tough to see uh, YouTube kind of slapping around record labels the way that that apple is famous for slapping around record labels um so w i mean it'll be interesting to see we don't know yet the the this is all still rumored um i believe this week is the big google developer conference so we might actually get an announcement this week of what um this new music service is it seems like there might be a way for you to pay a monthly subscription fee to watch music videos without ads which would be sweet um, so we'll see what's, what's going on with that. Um, I don't have any other thoughts on I that. Still, there's still one thing I don't get. So if it goes for everybody, why haven't some labels signed? 
Like, why are label certain labels resisting? On what point are they resisting? Well, that's what we don't we don't know what part of the agreement they don't want to apply to them. So there is uh, something in the agreement. So this other this part of the memo that leaked tells us that they are going to get a greater percentage rev share, but right. We don't know what the terms of the deal is are a whole as a whole. All we have is that internal memo from within a record label that agreed explaining why they think it's good. We don't mm -hmm. have any uh, we don't know the nature of the agreement uh, and we don't know what part of it people are objecting to. Mm -hmm. um, I think maybe I'm, I'm remembering the Forbes article I read on this was talking about independent labels resisting. And maybe they intimated that it's because they're not going to get as much money in the deal in some way or something. I don't know. Anyway, that, that clears it up for me. Thanks, right. Dave. Well, there we'll go. see. We'll see. I, it may, and maybe there is something like that where they get a greater percentage of the ad revenue at a certain point uh, or something like that. It could be a sliding scale, which is, is, is very common or something else about what YouTube is allowed to do with the content. Um, it, it's possible that people aren't while well, uh, it could be something like, the the labels that have agreed to this program um are, agree to let their music be used by users to make their own remixes and stuff um i could see that being a part of it um and and, and that and artists, is a great thing i i agree but i can also understand uh labels not wanting to put their music up for that kind of use i have no idea i'm just thinking of some things that youtube might want labels to agree to that would be a benefit to YouTube, um, but that labels might be uncomfortable with. So we, again, we will have to wait and see on this. Um, How are they going to handle a convoluted situation like uh, Girl Talk? Like, is he going to be able to put his stuff on YouTube and then they will Sam, say, well, it's 15% this. You're, and... you're way too far ahead. So we don't know. Yeah. Um, and in fact, well, that's I we what I want to know. Well, we're we're never gonna know because girl talk is far too sneaky. Um, so uh, the last thing that Sam wanted to talk about, and this is this is a very Sam story, so I will I will let him talk about it. Is things like girl talk, normal people that are taking uh, the tools that are available to them and trying to ch change the way the music business works. Right. Well, it's it's not a, a hugely deep piece. It just poses sort of a question about the rise of um, crowdfunding, and I would say the, the democratic nature of information transference also, not just um, crowdsourcing and that kind of thing. Uh, what effect is it going to have or is it having on the music industry, and is it good or bad? And it, it actually doesn't say it's all just, uh, you know, unicorns and rainbows. Um, as an example of one of the things that, uh, like a big thing that can happen that is driven by, uh, you know, individual engagement through a, uh, a uh, crowdfunding campaign. As an example, they start off with a 1994 Apex Twin album that was scrapped before it was released. Uh, only five test pressings were uh, made. And then, of course, eventually it shows up uh, somewhere where somebody gets their hands on it and says, this is awesome and we need to get this ready for release. So they start a crowdfunding uh, campaign and raise $67,000 and now it's available for purchase and you can listen to it for free on YouTube, at least perhaps until Monday. <laughs> um, so that's the fans who love Apex Twin found this piece and on their own, sidestepping the music industry, sidestepping everybody else that is normally involved in taking this kind of product to market and made it happen just because they love the music. Um, that's a very small example, but another one is uh, the Foo Fighters. Now, Dave pointed out that this has happened before, but I'd never heard of this, so it's amazing to me. The Foo Fighters are going to be playing in Richmond, Virginia for the first time. Uh, have they Foo Fighters been around that long? For 16 years. In 16 They're pretty old. You're mm -hmm. pretty old. I'm so <laughs> old. Um, man, they've been cranking up the hits forever. Uh, yeah. The Foo Fighters are going to play in Richmond, Virginia because of a fan campaign that was sort of like a crowdfunding thing where they pre-sold tickets to a concert in Richmond, Virginia that didn't exist. So they were then able to say, hey, Foo Fighters, look, we've already filled this stadium or whatever full of people. Now come here. And they are. So mission accomplished. So once again, you know, you have 
fans who want something to happen and by pooling their pooling resources where the amount of effort it takes on most individual levels is like yeah i'd love to see a Foo fighters concert here's my i don't know how much a Foo fighters concert yeah, there's a there's a service called uh something like we demand that specializes in this kind of crowdfunding and um I remember reading something about uh, another one called Rabble that does similar things uh, where where you can kind of uh, – I'm not sure exactly how it works. I think artists can sign up for it as well where they can say, hey, tell us, tell us where you want to hear us. And uh, people, you know, sign up for, for whatever and, and pledge to buy tickets if they do a certain show. And if it reaches that threshold where that show is going to earn a certain amount of money or maybe just break even, then they do the show. So I mean, it's a right. it's a very cool, very cool thing uh, that 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 fans can can have that much control and that much interaction with the artists that that they they love. So right now, the author goes on to point out that the uh, he says the initial Google-eyed utopian phase, where people think, oh, this is it, this is the thing, it's going to change everything. It does. It hasn't really changed everything yet. It's it's just made some really cool things happen. Most of the media of any kind we get is still funneled through the biggest, most traditional sources. Um, but it is a way to sidestep the middleman. But it also, you know, creates situations where, you know, we uh, often paint the big record industries as <laughs> more or less bad. You know, kind of like the corporate mentality doesn't think about the little man. They only think about profits, et cetera. But um, like Amanda Palmer's... Uh, Kickstarter campaign, which was very successful in terms of getting money, but she also used it as a way to recruit unpaid musicians. Um, and I think that it was somewhat exploitative. And so the author is using that as an example of how this, it's not, it's just a way to make things happen. The things that happen can be good things or bad things. Let's not forget that, you know, you can, uh, you Let's can try to uh, use our powers only for good. Yeah, you can use this to take advantage of people in the same way you can use it to make something cool happen. Yeah. Um, they kind of he kind of gets into a, sort of the social aspect of um, how, what it's like doing this kind of thing. Um, and it, I don't know that there's a lot to say about it, but it was an interesting that he pointed it out that it's it's crowdfunding is seen sort of as this community-based inclusive thing, but the agreement you're going entering is a one-on-one -on -one individual thing, you know? So it's in, in a big way, it's the opposite of this community-based, uh, you know, crowd thing. It's me paying Dave for his saxophone piece and then somebody else paying you. And it's all these individual relationships between you and those people. Um, so it doesn't, the, the author says that it, it espouses isolationism. I don't think it does that. I think it just doesn't create this happy unicorn community-based thing the way people try to portray it. It's just a way to – it's a way to let an individual pay for something they want, and that's the end of the – you know, the, the, the depth of the relationship is an individual one like that. It doesn't create a community. It allows communities to harness the power of the community, but it itself, the act of – crowdsourcing something doesn't create a community. Yeah. Unless you wrap it up in enough advertising and hype like Amanda Palmer did to make it into this thing where people, for whatever reason, agree to go to your concerts and play for beer and pizza. Hey, she got to go to TED. Yeah, she did. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, it's, it's really interesting. And we'll link to the story. Um, it's not not like a, like a big news item it's kind of just a, an observation of a trend that we're seeing and that that we think is is pretty interesting um, so you should definitely definitely check this this article out we we've, we've talked about crowdsourcing plenty on the show and i thought it was a good yeah a i've heard of it thing. actually yeah so um sad to say we have missed for two weeks now or three weeks now. We missed a couple of weeks Pass uh, saying, the saying goodbye of Lee. to Lee Hyla. Yes, and there aren't any composers, I'm sure, who watch the show who haven't heard about this. Um, but Lee Hyla, who writes the strangest, coolest music, you know, it's right up there with the strangest, coolest, like how did he think of that kind of music you'll ever hear, I think. Um, passed away, he was only 62, and I never met him, uh, but 
very important to lots of people that I know and respect. So uh, rest in peace, Lee Hyla. And uh, and it's for real this time. I actually uh, SN Weekly hashtag this story several months ago, and then before the show found out that it was a rumor, an unsubstantiated rumor, even though it was in some news outlets. Horace Silver has, in fact, passed away. Um, it's on NPR, so NPR hopefully has it right. He was 85. If you not, don't know, he was a piano player, kind of known as one of the fathers of hard bop, um, and was performing right up until the very end. And Song for My Father is a song that I've, because it's an easy song to sort of get under your fingers, I have played that song at gigs like hundreds and hundreds of times. And so the preacher. I will, the preacher? The preacher. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. song is. Yeah. Another big one. Yeah. That's so, what, that's, so will, you, you, your, your Horace Silver interaction is on, is on Song for My Father. Mine is, is on the playing, is playing the preacher. Nice. So. so anyway, goodbye to two greats in the music world. I think that's it for today. That's it. We're going to have links to those uh, stories that we talked about. We talked about a lot of different stories today, including... Um, uh, there, there are just so many different opinions on uh, some of the things that we talked about, especially the Klinghoffer stuff. Uh, and we'll have links to a, a bunch of different perspectives on those things uh, in our show notes at soundnotion.tv slash SN. I want to thank Kevin for joining us this morning. Kevin, My pleasure. It, it has was, been fun. It was Thanks great for having, having you. Thanks for filling in on short notice, man. No problem. Um, and thank you for your quality work on Streamers and Punches. You guys, oh, have, you're very bagged well. some, you guys have bagged some big dogs recently. Yeah, we got some. Had some good interviews. Yeah, yeah. Who, tell, tell us, tell us some of the. Not drop some names, Kevin. Drop some. Well, okay. Well, um, last up we had John Ottman, who is uh, certainly, certainly, uh, in terms of recognition and and resume and everything, one of the biggest composers we've had uh, ever on the show. Um, we we had him on Indeed. about a month and a half ago um, to talk about his score to X Men: Days of Future Past. He scored that one. He scored um, in X2. Theaters in theaters now. That's right. He scored X2. He scored Superman Returns. He's been, done a couple animated movies. Um, interesting guy. Uh, before that, we talked to Jeff Beale, uh, mostly known as the House of Cards composer, although he's done a bunch of stuff as well. Um, those have been kind of our last two interviews and both really great guys to, to chat with uh, and both having kind of big projects that they've come out with recently. So. Yeah, the, I, I would say both of those episodes are worth checking out. Those those were great guys to to chat with. Excellent, and we would encourage you to do that. Uh, it's, it's great, great show. Soundnotion.tv slash sap. If you want to check out streamers and punches for Kevin and Bill's insight on on all things film music, mm -hmm. um, and they have links to all their stories there too. And uh, definitely um, something that is that is worth your time, even if you don't know anything about film music like me, you will learn a lot. Yeah. Uh, from from listening to them talk about it, I know I learn a lot listening to it, listening to them talk about it every month. Um, if you would like to connect with us, if you want to share your thoughts on the Klinghoffer thing or any of the other stuff that we talked about today, you can connect with us on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube. Uh, you can use hashtag SN Weekly if you'd like to tweet uh, a link to a story that, or a topic that you want us to talk about on the show. We always look at that as we're putting the show together. Uh, as a group, we're at Sound Notion individually. I'm at Dave McDow. Kevin is at Kevin Wilt. And uh, Sam is at House Goy. So he's had he has some some perspective on the Klinghoffer situation. Um, so uh, you can subscribe to this show and all our shows in the iTunes store or wherever finer podcasts are aggregated. If you like the Stitcher machine, you can use Stitcher on your phone. Um, you can support our show uh, a lot of different ways. We have links to, to, to just give us money on the site. If you don't want to give us money, that's cool. We understand. Um, there's an Amazon affiliate search link there. So if you're just buying stuff on Amazon, just search for it using the little box on our site and we get a little commission. It doesn't cost you anything. And another thing that's totally free is sharing it with your friends and leaving us a, a kind review in iTunes or, or wherever podcast directory you find us in. Uh, that would really help us out as well. So thank you so much for everyone who's done those things already. Uh, and thank you to uh, Tyler Lepp, who created the video introduction for this show, and Patrick Gulo, who created the, uh, the, the music that went with it. Uh, we will be back next week uh, on the schedule. We have an interview with Kate Soper, so that should be very cool. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next week.